Okay, so now as part of this conference, we have quantum probability past, present, and future. We have a panel session, so discussion, panel discussion. So I uh, thought we would have it so that students, everybody gets some idea what is the progress, and what we can expect, a general perspective, a general picture. So for this, uh, I invite first Professor Kyapak sir to come to the desk. <laughs> so, you know, Professor Kyapak Sarathi is one of the founding fathers of the subject, the Hudson Park Sarathi calculus. And his book is the main book we follow. And it has, it has however, other books, they are also very popular, they are very excellent books. So, he is the, the first president of our association.
actually talking to Professor Mayer at that time about uh, the work I had been doing with Robin Hassan during my visit to England. Even then, uh, we were not using the phrase uh, we were simply just doing the subject, trying to learn and prove theorem, but under no heading. And uh, I stayed in Robin's home and we together wrote some papers on the subject. And then uh, Robin came with the idea that is he, he, he had already discussed some, some problems concerning probability and quantum. He had already written important problems under the heading of canonical linear processes, quantum canonical linear process, quantum central limit theorem. Quantum central limit theorem, I think he proved sometime in the 70s. And for the same theorem, I gave another proof in 1975. So uh, I met Robin in a, first in a conference, and uh, Robin had submitted this paper on uh, central limit theorem to the Journal of Applied Probability, which was of which the chief editor, Professor Joe Rami was also the head of the head of the uh, University of Sheffield, uh, head of the statistics and probability department at the University of Sheffield. And he asked me to refere his paper of Robin Hudson. And I found it very interesting and I recommended his paper. And then we met at a conference of the London Mathematical Society and that was how my friendship with Robin Hudson began. And I came back to India in the 70s and uh, I used to visit England every year because I had a grant at the to do this at the University of Bobby. And this, whenever I visited England, I also visited Nottingham, and sometimes I stayed with Robin Hudson at his home, and we used to work on problems of probability as the problems of probability as they arise in quantum mechanics. It was what, during one of those visits we wrote an article on what are called time orthogonal time orthogonal direction I think I don't remember the title, the exact title which was published in the Japanese journal uh, of which Professor Araki was the editor then our friendship continued and around uh, in the 80s, uh, Robin had a conversation with the mathematical physicist, Ray Streeter, who had authored a book on the entitled PCT spin statistics and all of that, I think, uh, with Whiteman, right? Whiteman and Streeter. And then, at that time, Araki had written a very important paper on uh, uh, complete factors of Boolean algebras. I, I don't know where I get Araki and Woods. The Araki and Woods theorem was true, and he had made many interesting comments about uh, infinitely divisible distributions. So, still got interested in. In infinitely divisible distributions, and he invited me to Bedford College and give some 
lectures on the theory of infinite radiation or distributions. While talking to him, he told me that these are very important in building, constructing representations of infinite diameter groups, current groups, and so probability theory and group representations uh, had a very nice overlap at this point, thanks to the Haraki books, famous paper. Then Robin and Streeter had a put forward uh, a big uh, formulation of the quantum neutral formula for D and D and R. There, there was no real proof for a well formulated theorem. But the wrote D A D A data should be DT. So that gave a good hint. And since then Robin and I were began to continuously work on this problem. And in my 83 visit I think to Warwick University, we used to work long hours in the seminar room. Robin used to come from Nottingham, stay put in Warwick University guest house. And we used to work long hours. And it was there we created the picture for DA Daga, D lambda, DA, DT, the table. And then its importance in stochastic evolution. The first quantum stochastic evolution. We wrote and proved the existence of unitary solutions under some conditions. Then Robin told me that it should be written as two papers, separate one paper on DA, 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 DT, and another one, a subsequent paper, DA, 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 DT. And I said, no, it doesn't look nice. It should be just one paper integrating everything. So, anyway, Professor Araki, who was the editor of CM Communications in Mathematical Physics, he sent it to me. And then he sent it back saying, please put the two papers together. So, we came to an agreement. And we wrote the 1984 paper. That was how started on the Then in 1982, I attended the Dilla conference which was advertised this morning by Professor Bola. And it was during that conference I heard this phrase, quantum probability. And it was held in a nice villa, but uh, it had no blackboards because it was a Vatican residence, I think the Pope's residence, and that didn't see any need for putting up a blackboard anywhere. Everything was by production. I remember one night I saw, sat down and wrote all the transparencies for my lecture. Professor John Lewis gave the first lecture of the conference, if I remember correctly. And then I came to know of the famous paper, Akardi Fujay Lewis paper on quantum stochastic processes. <coughs> it was after that I began to read that paper and I know, came to know about things like the instrument, complete positivity and its role in stochastic processes. And then what is quantum conditional expectation? All these basic questions have been discussed by the EIFL paper. So I think that was so that was before the quantum meter formula. But stochastic processes, even if you go to classical probability, 
that is a period of stochastic process before eta and after eta. Before eta is the general theory of processes, what is a suburban process, what are the measures, how do you make the measure new in a good function space. All these things were, uh, or you may find it in the 1953 first book of J.R. Duke on stochastic process. But Ito came into the scene and uh, he looked at, uh, of course there was a stochastic integral written by Wiener. In the 20s, Wiener discovered the uh, Brownian motion as a probability measure in the space of continuous trajectory and then he defined the Wiener, Wiener, Wiener integral between integral FdB where F is only a function of time. He defined that you know that B has Brownian motion has unbounded variation, so ordinary integration is not good. So by using integration by parts, he defined and put down some properties, and he uh, indicated also how uh, what is called the chaos expansion comes, and that also reveals the connection between Fox space and you know the L2 of the in a space. But uh, they didn't go beyond that. But I think around 1944, in, uh, in, uh, in the Japan Academy paper, Ito proposed the more general notion. He wrote two papers. He proposed the more general notion of interval then wrote down the Euter's formula. And the subject began to, began to not to develop, it began to develop after he, after he wrote these two papers. And there was no, there was no limit to its growth. <coughs> then the French school intervened and developed this uh, Stochastic integration to a very, very sophisticated level, measure theoretically and also thought wise, and they were introduced in the term of CAD lab processes. Continue a lot about the lab. We have a French expert here. CAD lab expansion, you know. Limit Agosh. Agosh, a limit Agosh. Space of parts, parts uh, right continuous parts with left limit. So that is the natural place, natural trajectory space for all stochastic process and how to perform integration of semi martingales on with the, the trajectories in those uh, in those function spaces. But then uh, strangely enough in in economics, this abstract integral, the economists took to uh, these abstract integrals in which on capital parts on the generalized little uh, formula of these parts. And after uh, all under Mayer was the way. There was a conference in honor of Mayer, uh, in memory of Mayer in Strasbourg. And uh, it, I was surprised to meet many economists uh, there. And uh, they were all talking about singing Martin Wales. And of course, they immediately switched on to profits and losses, which I never understood. But they used the stochastic process and interval. And it's a very sophisticated subject. And, uh, and the Russian school and the French school, they developed it uh, highly. But the, the value of these processes in economics you know, was naturally understood first in the United States. And then uh, came back to. France 
And in France, people were talking about the American option and such. And such places, where many American places you enter the theory of stochastic process and books so over so time in that action. So it is during that period uh, we were Hudson and I were working on the theory of stochastic integration and uh, Hudson came with this beautiful proposal of describing diffusion processes. Algebraically and uh, came with the Evans Hudson equation, which are really a very beautiful place, which is a very, very beautiful development in, this, in the growth of our subject. I think afterwards uh, other people took over, and uh, of course, I worked with. Both with JJ uh, as well as Kalyan in my in our different travels. After the Mahabharata conference, Akar we visited Delhi and we discussed many problems in my office home. I think you stayed for a month in Delhi, yes. At least two or three. Yeah, he stayed for more than two months at least. Yeah. Yeah. two months. Then I became quite a regular visitor for Rome and I stayed at his residence. And I knew Daniela, his wife, and he used to work very hard. And then on the other hand, in Kalyan, it was there we happened to develop the theory of stop time. But stop time was first, uh, the first theorem in stop, uh, stop time in one of charismatic characters. Discovered by Robert Hudson, and then I, I worked on this subject with Kalyan uh, to put a higher degree, and then later I worked with Raja on his thesis on this subject stop time in the Markov, Markov process, and what is a strong Markov process. I presented in a course of a summary of this work in Grenoble where Stefan Hattel uh, organized a uh, new workshop. So I have dwelt for too long on the past and I would like my colleagues to ruminate on present and future.
I found the papers by Benham Kim. I before coming here, I just had a concerning group. Papers by Benham Kim, and virtually he has a large number of papers and his associates. And I found that one very interesting paper in CLP by Pellegrini. And it seems to me that Pellegrini virtually, virtually work somehow integrates the French school of uh, classical and stochastic calculus and quantum stochastic calculus in a very nice way. Only I have lost the stamina and also I have lost my eyesight. So I am not able to do that hard work, but I would be very happy to see some young people read these papers and then, uh, and then uh, make their own new development. Bachelet was the first person to introduce uh, uh, what I call continual collapse and measurement. And that produces uh, another class of uh, real equations as well as equations of density operator. And that equation looks very interesting. And it is because some young people came to me and asked, I began to look into this, otherwise I must not have looked into this. And they gave me a chance open my eyes to one of those here again. So I will stop here and we will request no in my the KBC na thank you say comment. Okay I will take a little bit of a contrary view in the sense I start with the statement that we should not forget that quantum mechanics was principally created to solve problems in physics. And therefore, the, and also we should not forget that initial days after initial struggle was over, uh, that quantum mechanics was principally right from the day zero was a probabilistic theory. Don't forget the famous statement of Einstein that when he, in disbelief, he said God, he doesn't believe that God plays dice. So the quantum mechanics was being pitched as a probabilistic theory, though it did not emerge suddenly like that, it took a fair bit of time. And in this context, I would digress for a moment and particularly address myself to the younger people here to try to get hold of this movie, uh, which was uh, made in the occasion of the centenary of the general theory of relativity of Einstein. I think last year or year before last, uh, National Geographic made this movie in 10 parts about Einstein. So it tries to recreate Einstein's younger days in Zurich and it tries to bring to focus his uh, close colleagues, particularly Marcel Grossman, who was instrumental in introducing Einstein to geometry. And uh, it is a very instructive film, though of course there is a lot of drama and things introduced like all movies, but still it recreates the atmosphere of that time, which was really electric, to say the least, with people like <coughs> Bohr, Heisenberg, and such people coming to meet him and interacting, and the way he, because he was already a little senior by the time people like Heisenberg and others emerged, so he could uh, sort of admonish them. In fact, they show a place where he is admonishing Heisenberg about something. So, so that's a very nice movie for you to see if you get hold of it. Uh, so that you can have a feeling of those times when quantum mechanics was being born at the hands of its real creators. So coming back, so quantum mechanics was a theory created mainly for physics for reasons pretty well known and I need not repeat it here because physicists found great difficulty in reconciling many of the observations with the existing theory. So they had to look for alternative theory. And after many fits and starts, we must not forget that even a great man like Orr made ample mistakes okay, while searching 
for the correct theory. So there are lots of mistakes and pitfalls, but people ultimately overcame. So today we only look at the final structure. That was not the way it was created. After a lot of struggle, the structure that we say today, and that structure is probabilistic, as you have seen at least a few times. It has been projected on the uh, during the lectures. Okay. That is in the modern language, which came again still further down the road, uh, like an uh, algebra, star algebra, and states on n, etc. So, what I want to emphasize is though the basic structure of the theory is probabilistic, but physicists enquiry would not certainly end with that. That is zero at stake actually for a physicist. For a physicist, they want to actually connect with the observations that you are making. And as I think some speaker in during these proceedings mentioned, that you have to calculate what you don't see is what you actually solve. What mathematics solves are not what you actually see. What you see are not so, for example, the Schrodinger theory. You have a certain Hamiltonian, which is an operator. You do a spectral analysis of it. So you get eigenvectors, eigenvalues. That is not even a beginning. What you want to know is that how does atom or electron, whatever, goes from one eigenvector to another? What does it mean by goes? How does it go? So there is an interaction. I think some of the authors did mention this. There is an interaction. But when you introduce interaction, all hell breaks loose. Mathematics more or less disappears. I dare say, even today, there is no consistent mathematics which deals with this problem in its entirety. Essentially, there is a total failure on that front. The reason is that how does an atom make a transition from one state to another? You have to bring in interaction with the electromagnetic field, the radiation field. Once you bring in the radiation field, you change the structure of your theory considerably. You introduce what are called infinite degrees of freedom. So mathematics changes drastically. You are you see, for a single particle, you are in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, as many speakers have mentioned. But when you have infinite number of particles, what kind of space do you imagine? And that was the, one of the biggest struggles in the initial days of so-called quantum field theory. And I don't think, even today, the problems that plagued the conceptual part of quantum field theory has been adequately addressed. The physicists, of course, as you can expect, and they are very clever about these things, they found a way to extract finite results out of an infinite series of infinities. So you have an infinite series with each term infinite. How do you deal with such a thing? What mathematics do you create? I don't think anyone knows yet. But they did some, they had a way of extracting finite numbers out of it. And that became one of the astounding successes of the subject of quantum electrodynamics. Now, in order to circumvent the problems which was plaguing the mathematically oriented people, the so-called algebraic theory of quantum mechanics was created. I think one of the earliest papers, if I recall correctly, I don't know, Michael may correct me, uh, Hag and Kassler, 1964. And they tried to put everything in a very algebraic background. But it gave a few nice results, particularly Hans Avaraki, who, who showed quite a few interesting results in the context of algebraic quantum field theory, what are called algebraic quantum field theory. But it failed to address the main issue, the issue of interactions. I don't think it has been addressed even today. The other competing approach, which was more analytical, which was being pursued those days when I was a student in the late 60s uh, by people like Jaffe and Gleam, I recall producing reams of preprints with 100 page preprint, 
just to prove the self adjuvantness of the Hamiltonian. It was very hard as analytic problem. And after that comes the actual calculation, which they have not even begun. So this question of addressing how to handle so many infinity of infinities has been a real serious problem. Physicists have a, have, a, have a prescription of dealing with it. And one of the problems that Haag analyzed, and that's why it is known as Haag's theorem, so Haag never proved a theorem. And I don't think anyone could prove the theorem which uh, really can go as Huck's theorem. Essentially, what Huck's theorem tries to say is that these infinities are what it is describing, that you are actually jumping representations. The representation is, that is the fog representation, where you have seen most of the objects who are being addressed, is totally inadequate to deal with the representation where physics happens. So you will have to go to a representation which is rather complex. In fact, Jim, in one of his statements in the early days when he was working in this area, he said there are at least uncountably many irre inequivalent irreducible representations of the canonical formulation. When you have so many representations, which one do you choose to do physics? And that has remained an enigma even today. We don't know, and no physicist knows even today, which representation you should work with, to start with. So this is a very, very unsatisfactory state of affairs. Now, I look, my point of view on so-called quantum probability, because I don't, I think the terminology is a bit unfortunate, as I tried to say. Quantum mechanics had probability in its beginning. So what do you mean by quantum probability as a subset of quantum theory? Probably it was not meant to be so, I don't know. So I do not like the word quantum probability, but I use it nevertheless, the others use it. I would say that one of the main objectives uh, at present, after the development of hudson pathosarathy and allied uh, theories and studies, would be to understand, for example, <coughs> from mathematical point of view, uh, non-equilibrium phenomena. I think Franco has uh, tried to understand it, some of it. But I think still quite far away because I don't think HP calculus any, plays any role there. Franco, please correct me if I am, I am wrong. In HP calculus per se, I have not seen anything to do with your, 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 your analysis. It may be in the background, yes. You will use CP semi-groups and uh, its generators, etc. But that is, that is an important area which I think uh, not enough uh, has been done from the point of view of applications of, uh, say, uh, quantum stochastics, uh, quantum stochastic calculus. So I would like to see that being handled in a, in a serious way. That means the model should be somewhat more realistic and serious will involve difficult mathematics. I can, I can, I can bet that obviously, because I think Martin knows uh, the difficulty of handling some of these uh, mathematical uh, objects, and so difficulty will be there. Really. But a model has to be created where at least some of these partial difficulties will will remain, but some simpler, simple relaxation to equilibrium or equilibria, bria, because you can have multiple equilibria. Uh, I really don't know how to how to encode it in a person pathosarathy type of framework. In multiple equilibria. One equilibrium can be easily incorporated. But multiple equilibria, like uh, uh, Professor Ola was, was uh, sort of hinting at in classical context, uh, how to program that in, in quantum stochastic calculus, uh, I don't know, but it should emerge. And so the mathematics probably uh, should develop accordingly to handle such uh, issues. Uh, that is, uh, in other words, non equilibrium, uh, description of non equilibrium quantum mechanics in some model. Obviously, this is an idealized model. Uh, can quantum stochastic calculus play a role in developing? Non-equilibrium quantum stochastic model. 
So I look, I think of that as a possible future direction of the route. And uh, I think Franco has, uh, has made a beginning in it, but there should be more done. Particularly with the stochastics thrown in in full, full, full uh, glory. Otherwise, I don't think you can capture the connection between uh, the, the fluctuations and the dissipations. That's why I was telling Stefan uh, Ola today in the meeting. I, I don't think he's here. That you know, the the the, the, the friction or dissipation should not be a God-given thing. It should be a result of fluctuation. Like the engineers, engineers, all, all of the engineers model it that way. Okay. Nyquist theorem in engineering is a very, very standard theorem, which does that. The oscillations, fluctuations connect with your dissipation. So I would look at, that is a possible, difficult, but possibly doable mathematical program using some evolved Hudson Patasarathy or something like that equations. I stop here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to invite the media card. Thank you, sir. Is, uh, uh, what I want to try to do is uh, to mm, give a very quick uh, um, outline of uh, uh, what uh, was uh, quantum probability before this name existed. In fact, quantum probability was born in physics and in mathematics. And uh, uh, apparently there are uh, two main routes originally for, quantum, uh, for what we call now quantum probability, which is uh, uh, one is uh, the foundation, the foundational problem. If you think and reflect a moment, you will uh, recognize that on the foundational problem of quantum mechanics, there have been written a number of books incomparably greater than on the foundational problem of classical mechanics. But classical mechanics is about 300 years before quantum mechanics. So there was a lot of time. Why so few books? Why is, I would say the contrary. Why so many books on the foundation of quantum mechanics? Because people, as Heisenberg himself said, we introduced a formalism that is far from our intuition. The formalism was working perfectly. And the physicists learned how to use it. And mathematicians began to analyze it and to understand it. But the situation around 1930 was, I, we could describe it as a joke, like if there exists a chicken which makes golden eggs, you can have two attitudes. The attitudes of collect the golden eggs and use them. And this was the attitude of the physicist. And the attitude of trying to understand why such a chicken makes golden eggs, from where do they come? And this was the attitude of mathematicians, who, as is well known, are more abstract people, a little bit more far from everyday uh, income and uh, needs. However, mathematicians gave an uh, important contribution also to the physics of quantum mechanics. In fact, one of the few people who I know among the mathematicians that are mentioned still now among the physicists is for Neumann. Why? Not because he proved the spectral theorem, which put on rigorous form the Hamiltonian, but the continuous spectral theorem, of course, the discrete had already been proved by Hilbert. But, but for Neumann is remembered because he, in three memorable papers, in the, uh, between 1926 and 1930, he introduced what is called nowadays quantum statistical mechanics. The quantum Gibbs ensemble was introduced by von Neumann. And two years after his papers, he published a famous book, a correctly famous book, which is called Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. So he did not refer to the specific problems. 
And if you look at the book, I strongly suggest, because it's still now a classic word to be read, you see the first part is the most mathematical part. It just sums up the spectral theorem. Then he introduced what I mentioned about a, a summary of his papers on introduction of a quant quantum set, what we call nowadays, what, that was the birth of quantum statistical mechanics. But the, the bulk part, the third part of the book, is entirely devoted to describe and try to explain in a mathematical language what is a general statistical theory. Because he had in mind the problem also of the foundations. In fact, in a little note in the book, he, in a little uh, section of the book, uh, he proved the first uh, theorem that gave rise to a huge avalanche of publication. He proved the first uh, so-called no-go theorem for Hildenberg. It goes back to von Neumann. It was then criticized by Bell. There is a long story. You see, each of the branches from which quantum probability took the move alone would deserve to just outline the history. Not 20 minutes, but one hour of talk. So we, I, I will only concentrate on the flashes and uh, uh, just try to try to stimulate you in this direction. So the foundations at that time had a really important impact because the natural question that everybody implicitly was putting in itself was this. Is the new formalism that the physicists themselves, like, like uh, uh, Heisenberg and uh, like Schrodinger himself, they were saying this mechanism is far from intuition, what is this necessary? Or can we do everything with the classical, with the classical physics? And this is uh, the origin of so-called hidden variable theory. The hidden variable theory is, uh, was surveyed by Nelson very well in his beautiful book on the, on the Brownian uh, dynamical theories of Brownian motion, and uh, you will find the history there, so I will not, I will not uh, uh, discuss it here. But this was one important point. Then, slowly, it, the other two important uh, sources were, as Karanz Dinas correctly said, they came from physics, namely, Statistical mechanics and quantum statistical mechanics. And, uh, sorry, and, uh, uh, statistical mechanics, classical and quantum, and quantum field theory. Two different, completely different directions. Quantum field theory was soon recognized to have a very strong connection with the probability. In fact, Siegel, I think, was the first to recognize that the Bose free field is essentially a realization of the Wiener, of the Wiener process, of a kind of multidimensional Wiener process. But if you look in this, uh, in his paper, in the, around the 60s, this was very, very clear. Uh, before Siegel, there was the other huge uh, uh, bridge between mathematics and quantum probability, which was the book by Hermann Weil on uh, group theory and quantum mechanics. Now, you look at the situation. The book of uh, Dirac was the first book on quantum, on quantum theory, 1931. The book of Hermann Weyl, 1932. The book of Kolmogorov, which founded the mathematical formalism of classical probability, was 1933. So the book of Kolmogorov appeared when already the quantum physics had a strong settlement. You see, it, there is no mention in the book of Kolmogorov uh, or about quantum physics. Kolmogorov, like Einstein, well, Kolmogorov, like Einstein was a, a person of classical world. He was a one of really a great genius, but was a person of the classical world. So you can understand that this lack of communication. However, however, with the born interpretation of quantum mechanics, the statistical interpretation, 1927, um, it was completely clear that quantum 
theory was not only a new mechanics, but also a new probability. And in fact, in the seminar uh, 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 conducted by Hilbert in, uh, in uh, Heidelberg, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Go uh, in Göttingen, uh, which, uh, whose notes were published jointly under the name of uh, Hilbert, von Neumann, and Nordheim, they tried the first axiomatic approach to mathematically axiomatic approach to quantum mechanics. And strangely enough, this approach reminds not the von Neumann, what later von Neumann used in terms of, uh, um, of uh, the uh, observables and what we now call observables and states, which were introduced in the books of von Neumann. But it was much more similar to what we can now call the Feynman integral. It was based on green function and transition probabilities, this approach. Now, this was the situation in uh, between uh, around the 60s. And uh, uh, about uh, 10 years after, the mathematical approach to uh, statistical mechanics uh, was began to attack it. In the classical aspect, by the Brushin school in uh, Moscow, and in the quantum aspect, mainly by Araki, and then people like Hag and uh, um, very classical, more classical. Uh, the Hag Huguenot Winnick make a fundamental contribution, and this is not by chance that they it came from physics, uh, they introduced the famous KMS condition as a characterization of equilibrium state. Because in the representation that Kalyan was mentioned, this, this non-standard non representation, non-FOC representation of a, a, a commutation relation, there is no Gibbs measure, because there is no density matrix. Typically, the equilibrium state are type 3 factors. And so, the equilibrium condition should be formulated in a way which doesn't involve density matrix. So in this context, in this context, uh, the, just let me mention a last thing just to show how much foundational problems accompanied the main physicists all their life. Uh, if you look at all Feynman books, all the lecture notes in physics, the Feynman Higgs integral, his thesis, uh, his uh, main paper on the, on the uh, physical review, all they begin with the description of the Tuslit experiment. All these papers. Because Feynman felt very, very deeply what he called the mystery of quantum mechanics. And he, under, and he proposed this to the mathematicians in the Berkeley Symposium of 1952. He was invited and he posed this problem to the community of probabilists. So you see, the intertwining between concrete physical problem and the fundamental conceptual problem has been a characteristic of the development of quantum physics since the beginning. Now, in the 70s, uh, by I happened to be in Moscow and uh, I uh, was doing my uh, PhD which in Moscow is called Candidata Nauke and uh, Gelfand, uh, who was my supervisor told me if you want to understand uh, probability you have to learn sister algebra, statistical mechanics and stochastic processes so this combination of these three things are still now at the heart of what we could say the mathematics of quantum probability. Uh, in that time, Araki had published a, a paper on nearest neighbor spin systems. And Sinai, in the translation of a, a Ruel book, in fact, into Russian, he said, but since nearest neighbor potential in classical probability, automatically give Markov states, we should have a, such a similar property for quantum lattice systems. 
And uh, this problem hit me very much. And I began to work on it. At the, the end was my, uh, my thesis. I cannot uh, now go into the detail. But in this thesis, what was uh, came up very, uh, at the beginning, I tried to do the naive things, namely to translate in non commutative language the uh, standard quantum Markov chains. And this is a lot of quantum probability is done by pure translation. But this is the more superficial part of quantum And the dependency notion puts in light the deeper aspects where there are deep differences between classical and quantum probability. In fact, I, there this, I remember I almost uh, felt I had finished this construction and I was uh, on the beach in the summer, and at a certain moment, I don't know how, I, I realized that I used the Umegaki conditional expectation. At that time, Takesaki theorem was not yet been published, but the, the Takesaki theorem for matrices is very simple to, uh, to understand and to check. And you realize, and I realized that the only, pro, the only states on the tensor product of two matrix algebras who admit the Umegaki conditional expectation of product states. So essentially, from probabilistic meaning, this conditional expectation developed in the theory of operator algebras is working only one, when there is no dependence, so product state. But the essence of conditional expectation is to emphasize and to describe dependence. So I thought something wrong was, and I, I used a kind of pragmatical form formula that was enough to construct a new class of states. This class of states was not known in physics. So this is, a, in some sense, it came from pure mathematics. But then in, uh, in the late 90s, uh, Bruno Nachtergeil, uh, Fan, who, who did the thesis with me and, uh, on, on quantum Markov chains, and, uh, and uh, Fannes and Werner, they discovered that using quantum Markov chains, they could solve open problem studied by famous physicists like Lieb, Affleck, and uh, Kennedy on ground states of, of um, a certain special Hamilton, similar to the Heisen, famous Heisenberg model, you see. And this was a very deep discovery because the intuition of Markov chains, at least for me, was as Gibbs states. But they discovered that an important application of Markov chains is on uh, ground states, which are pure states. This is related to, to the talk with the, uh, the, uh, the Taka, uh, Taka uh, Matsuoka did uh, ye uh, yesterday about the entanglement, in the sense that uh, the, the, the ground states are very much entangled. Of course, density matrices are less. But this is uh, one point of the development. <coughs> the other important development came from uh, the experience with the, with the quantum field theory. Quantum field theory emphasized this difficulty. I will not describe because Kalyansina already described the essence of the difficulties. And the idea of local algebras was introduced to formalize this. At that time, the idea that uh, was rather clear that local algebra is nothing but a, gener a quantum and non-commutative generalization of stochastic processes. Because all the theory of stochastic processes is based on localization. Filtrations are a very special type of localization. To for formulate Markov property, you need another type of localization. So localization is essential in probability and was essential in probability from the beginning. And it became essential it became essential in physics. Then, the improbability, you have uh, some, uh, uh, the, the point is this, many people say von Neumann uh, introduced quantum probability. This is not true. Von Neumann introduced what we can call non-commutative measures. Why? Let me explain. <coughs> in, if you look, uh, uh, we say that Kolmogorov introduced uh, the modern language for, for uh, classical probability. But all the mathematical ingredients that Kolmogorov used, the 
sigma algebra, uh, the measure on abstract spaces, uh, the countable, countable additivity, etc. They were all very, very well known. Well known by Borel, uh, Italian mathematician Cantelli proposed the axiomatization of probability. Why do we say that Kolmogorov introduced it? Quanto? Because in Kolmogorov books there are the three things that distinguish probability from measure theory. And these are conditional expectation, notion of independence, and the notion of dependence, namely conditional expectation. In the Kolmogoro book, for the first time, there is the proof that now everybody knows of conditional expectation based on the Radonikodin theorem. It was not known. So the Kolmogoro book is the foundation, is, uh, how to say, the uh, foundation of a modern approach to probability, because it pointed out these three fundamental new points with respect to pure measure theory. Uh, but at that time, the analog of probability was very well known. But what was missing? Von Neumann knew that conditional probability was missing in his approach. In fact, there is a, I, not many people know, but there is a 220 manuscript that now has been published by Halferin. I think in the memoirs of the American Mathematical Society, but this was about 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I don't remember. Uh, the, von Neumann wrote a 220-page manuscript on condition, and he never published. Why? Because essentially what he found was a kind of base, non computer debate formula, you trace a density matrix time by projection dividing, uh, dividing the, 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 the trace of. The point is that uh, of the projection, e, 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 of the sub projection. But this you can do only for commutative projection. You cannot do for non commutative projection. So he was not satisfied. The conditioning problem is really a very deep problem and is another problem where you see the difference between classical and quantum. But still, at that time, we were speaking. AI, for example, the first papers I wrote uh, were, were not on quantum probability, they were on non-commutative probability. The term quantum came, uh, well, it existed in uh, 19, uh, when I was uh, in uh, Marseille, I just finished my PhD, I was in Marseille, I discovered that in Nottingham there was a conference called quantum probability. This conference was organized by Robin Hudson, and that is how I, I paid my, myself to go there and uh, to know what was meant under this name, and that is how I first uh, met uh, Robin Hudson, and uh, since then we became very good, good friends because we had a sincere common interest in this field, you see. But the point is this, the why quantum this to answer Kalyan, the answer why quantum and not non-commutative. Mathematicians don't like quantum. They like quantum groups, which are neither quantum nor groups, <laughs> but they don't like quantum probability, which is quantum and is probability. <laughs> and so why we can speak of the quantum probability? And this came with the, uh, uh, a point which I think uh, is conceptually important. I always was struck by Feynman's insistence on the two-slit experiment. And uh, in the very late uh, 60s, uh, 69, uh, I was uh, giving a seminar in Pisa, and uh, a friend of mine who was a physicist, we, uh, and he was very, very fond on foundation and very, very fond on the Bell paper, he said, you cannot do cannot understand quantum mechanics if you don't read the Bell paper. So I went and read the Bell, the Bell paper and I tried to study it, to formulate mathematically. And I had studied two slit for, for many, many years. Since I was a student, I was, because I read these Feynman uh, books, they influenced me enormously. Then it, it came to me this uh, fact that mathematically, there is a hidden assumption which is common to the two slit and to the Bell. This hidden assumption is 
exactly what uh, we discussed uh, yesterday, the hidden postulate of existence of joint probabilities given some experimental data. You see, classical probability, where concerning probability, like classical geometers, were concerning geometry. That if they have a problem concerning space, they were using Euclidean geometry. It's completely clear. Because they did not know any other geometry. And so they, people like Feynman, people like Bell, they did. They were using Kolmogorov probability, because that was probability. And the, the implicit postulate of people was that there are no other mathematical models of probability. But in geometry, there was discovery, fundamental Gauss introduced the so-called theorema egregio. He called it egregio because he knew how important it was. Why it was so important? He explained the theorema egregio says that the difference between the sum of three angles of a certain triangle the difference between this and pi is the product of two things, the area of the triangle and a certain scalar that now everybody knows is called the Gaussian curvature. Why is the theorem is so important? Because the angles can be measured experimentally. And so Gauss understood perfectly that you can distinguish by experiments between Euclidean geometry and non Euclidean geometry. And this is the and this is the in the same thing happened in probability. Once you understand that the Bell and, and the two slit experiment have the same root, it becomes easy to construct a lot of examples on non Kolmogorovian data. For example, you can take the single spin, take a single spin matrix, and you can construct non, non there exist there exist some ma, uh, you can construct an example in both ways. That is of quantum conditional probability that do not admit a single Kolmogorov realization, and conversely, of classical probabilities that do not admit a uh, quantum pure realization as mod square of a unitary matrix. In fact, in the Villa Mondragone conference, I produced some examples of this thing. One example is, uh, the, is uh, at the root of the birth of what uh, the now called uh, quantum random work, because I gave the proof that uh, the symmetric, uh, classical symmetric random work is not unitary implementable. And this theorem has been generalized by many authors in more recent times. But the, the essence is this. You can detect by measurable things, measurable quantities, the difference between Kolmogorov and non-Kolmogorov. So this is the answer. Why quantum probability and not non-commutative? Non-commutative mathematics. You can generalize every part of mathematics to non-commutative. Set theory, combinatory, whatever. You can do. And it may be some interest there is, geometry, whatever. But in probability, you must be non commutative It's not an arbitrary choice. You must because the experiments oblige you to go beyond the Kolmogorov model. And this is the message, the real message of two slit and Bell. This is a contribution of quantum probability. Now, the modern, the modern front on this direction is, but are we sure that quantum physics is the only place where non kolmogorovian model appear? I posed this problem in the Nottingham conference in uh, the 2003, I think, or I don't remember, 2002, of course. I posed this problem, and after that, some important progress has been done. For example, the economics data from the uh, famous Nobel Prize in economics, Tversky and Shafir, 
they collected some data uh, concerning uh, uh, decision mechanism in economics and they showed that they cannot be modeled by standard probability, uh, not more precisely, classical macro model. And uh, in a paper with uh, Masanori Oya and uh, Krenigov, we proved that they cannot be described by any Kolmogorov model. So in economics, there are non Kolmogorovian data. We proved also a constructive part of the theorem. We proved that if you use a quantum Markov chain model, then you can reproduce this data. So it means that really the non Kolmogorovian models developed in quantum theory can be helpful in things like economics. Well, I want to conclude with a, a challenge, not to be discussed, but to, uh, because it would take us too far, but uh, as an invitation, especially to younger people, to think about these things, because sometimes the pressure to concentrate on on smaller horizon is very strong, especially in contemporary society. I understand this very well. So I want to propose a reflection on a, Ah, oh, this is, uh, yes, yeah, I gave it to you. I, I don't need to yes. He's projecting something, so I think ah, yes. Can I point, uh, just, uh, how to, um, the first part, yes. How to, um, ah, oh, just, okay, so. Since I am a mathematician, I, I restrict to what is a revolution in mathematics. Now, I, of course, everybody, uh, well, I propose the following criteria, which I think are objective. If somebody of you believes that I introduce some subjective opinion in this criteria. Please, let me know. I will be glad to change or to discuss it if I am convinced. So, the criterion one is this. That, so, the, the idea is there are four criteria to distinguish between what Kuhn calls normal science and what Kuhn calls scientific revolution. Kuhn is a, philosopher, a famous philosopher of science in America. Uh, he published in the 70s, called The Structure of Scientific Revolution, is the name of his book. So, the first criteria is this, that the, the new developments of the new theory should not be confined to on an isolate, isolated result, even if very important, but they should embrace an entire discipline, from foundation to the most sophisticated technical development. So this is the first criterion which seems to me rather reasonable. Second criteria, the new development should bring to light a to unexpected connection between important objects emerging in different times, in different fields of research, and no, in, uh, in different fields of mathematics and also of physics. Or they should reveal unsuspected structures of simple and ubiquitous objects. Or they should suggest new experiments or they should allow the introduction of new technology. Maybe quantum information is a challenge in the last direction. 
And the third criterion is the new development should solve open problem also outside mathematics with a long independent history and a huge literature published in, in books of recognized scientific level. So you should be able to check that you solve problems outside a single field. And the last criterion is the new development born from a combination of technical problem with philosophical problem. And they should have deep conceptual implications, which can be understood also by the non-specialists. So if you really change, if you think, for example, the introduction of quantum mechanics, it was such a revolution. It created conceptual problems. These conceptual problems could be explained to common people. So this is a, a, an invitation to reflect on these problems. And from this reflection, some operative indication can come. Thank you.